Hi, and welcome to Northwest Brew Talk. I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. And this is episode number 32. Each week we promote the Washington brewing industry by talking to those people involved and drinking Washington beer. With almost 300 breweries, we try to highlight as many as possible every episode. If you're new to the show, we suggest you check out our back catalog with some great interviews and lots of Washington beer. On today's show, we have an interview with Snipes Mountain Brewing. Our brew news and views and local music from Beatrix Sky. If you have any comments or questions, send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at nwbrewtalk and on Facebook at facebook.com slash nwbrewtalk. If you like the show and want to support us, why not become a patron? With a donation, we offer everything from a guest hosting the show to a copy of our upcoming book, Washington Beer. Head over to nwbrewtalk.podbean.com for more details. To start the show, let's open our first beer. All right. This week, we have Amber's hot friend from Skookum Brewery. Skookum Brewery opened in 2007 and moved to a new location in 2012. They are open Wednesday through Sunday in Arlington, cash only, and they're 21 and over. So here's the first beer. Amber's Hot Friend is a West Coast style ale, and it's brewed with a shapely malt body and enough hops to keep her feisty. Amber's Hot Friend will never leave you with any bitter feelings. All right, this is one of their first or maybe only beers that they're bottling. And it's a pretty amber color, darker color. It's pretty good. Yeah, I definitely like it. Yeah, this is one uh, This is one of the first ones that you liked uh, last year, actually. Yeah, it is. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Um, yeah, that's a pretty good beer. Nice one to start with. And today's are all ales, so they will be... Uh, all in that same family. <laughs> All right, and now on to our brew news and views. This Saturday, September 5th, North Sound Brewing in Mount Vernon is celebrating its fifth year anniversary with a big party. They'll have Hickory Avenue barbecue, live music, beer specials, and special beers, including batch 300 barrel fermented farmhouse ale made with a six row album malt, grown and malted right here in Skagit Valley, and fermented in oak bourbon barrel with a Belgian farmhouse yeast. Bellingham Beer Week runs from September 11th through September 20th throughout Bellingham. Opening ceremonies are Friday the 11th at Elizabeth Station. There's tons of events, so visit BellinghamBeerWeek.com for more details. The official Bellingham Beer Week beer will be released during Beer Week. Brewed by most of the Bellingham brewers, Northwest Local Lager was brewed with Alba and Copeland Malt from Skagit Valley Malt and Cascade Chinook, Amarillo, and Mount Hood Hops from Yakima. Okay. Sunday, October 4, from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., is Pike Toberfest. will be held at Pike Brewing in Seattle. Tickets include 10 drink tickets, authentic pink to our Pike Toberfest beer mug, all food, music, and discounted parking. There will be local meats, sauerkrauts, cheeses, and more, paired with craft beers, wines, and spirits. This annual event benefits the Pike Place Market Foundation and is a 21 and over event. Friday. October 23rd is Brew Seattle 2015. This event is the largest Seattle-only breweries event taking uh, tasting event of the year. Over 20 breweries will be serving over 60 beers at this third annual event. Pike Place Brewing is the reigning brewery of the year from last year's event. Tickets are $29 and include six tasting tokens. Sponsored by Seattle Magazine, they promise it will sell out, so dilly-dally at your own risk. Fremont Oktoberfest will be held from September 18th through the 20th. The three-day event has many events going on. There's a tasting garden with over 50 breweries. The Buxom Beer Garden, Miss Buxom 2015 Contest, Sports Bar, Live Music, Pumpkin Parving, a fa- Carving, Parving, Carving, a 5K Race, and more. Friday and Saturday are 21 and over, and Sunday is all ages, including your pooch. Visit FremontOktoberfest.com for more details. Boundary Bay Brewing is celebrating their 20th anniversary Wednesday, September 16th. And they're throwing the biggest block party Bellingham has ever seen. It just so happens that their anniversary falls smack in the middle of Bellingham Beer Week. They're kicking things off at 3 p.m. And will feature all kinds of awesome surprises. Zip line, live music, entertainers, food truck, rock wall, and much more. 
Do you like food trucks and beer? Trucktoberfest 2015 will be held October 3rd and 4th at Marymore Park. Over 30 food trucks and over 75 beers on tap. Visit mobilefoodrodeo.com for more details. That's all we had on that one. But uh, if we get more information, we're definitely going to bring that one. That's Absolutely. Cool. Sounds very cool. And let's see, the 2015 Fresh Hop Beer Week will be September 30th through October 4th in Yakima. The 2015 Fresh Hop Ale Festival will be held on October 3rd. Named as one of the 10 best beer festivals in the nation, this is the 13th annual event all about hops and beer that is produced with hops that were picked no more than 24 hours before brewing. Oh, wow. They plan on having over 40 breweries, uh, 40 breweries participate. There will be food, wine, cider, spirits, music, and proceeds from the festival. Not music and proceeds, but music, comma, and proceeds from the <laughs> festival go to the Yakima Valley Art uh, Organizations. Visit FreshHopAlFestival.com for details. And lastly today, Scuttlebutt Brewing Company has collaborated with 90.3 KEXP to create Transistor IPA, a crisp, session-friendly IPA with all proceeds to benefit the KEXP new home in Seattle Center. The beer is available starting this week in six packs and on draft. The label and packaging for Transistor IPA were designed by Dave Narciso, Narciso, Narcs, whatever, something like that. Co-founder of Lacuna Design and drummer for Throwing Muses. He joined Throwing Muses in 1983 and has been an active voice on the rock music scene ever since. And that is the Baby Infused Brew News and Views for this week. <laughs> Welcome back to Northwest Brew Talk. If you want to submit news to Northwest Brew Talk, send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. Or if you've not yet subscribed to our podcast, why not do it now? It's free, available anywhere you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Podbean, and Stitcher. If you like us, a review or rating would be greatly appreciated. But make sure you tell your friends about Northwest Brew Talk. All right, now let's talk to Chris from Snipes Mountain Brewing. Okay, we're with Chris Baum from Snipes Mountain Brewery. How are you? Good. Awesome. So let's uh, let's start on uh, on your background. How did you get into uh, brewing? Uh, brewed my first homebrew batch in like 2003 um, with some friends, um, and just kind of pursued it from there. Uh, just homebrewed for a long time for I guess about uh, I don't know eight years or so. Um, slowly going up from extract to partial you know partial what do you call it that steeping grains and whatnot and then building a a flat blue brew system uh 10 barrel or i'm sorry 10 gallon uh homebrew flat sculpture and then started uh assistant brewing for snipes uh the previous brewer to me chad roberts uh, he just needed some help, and I went down there and dug it and just kept volunteering until they paid me. And then I just kept coming back you know, part-time because mm-hmm. I had a, another job as a wildlife biologist. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Chad was ready to move on, I was ready to stop traveling as a biologist and just ran, you know, knew the system well. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I pretty much spend all of my time listening to stuff about beer, drinking beer, reading books about beer, <laughs> and so was able to just step right in. Um, the learning curve has been steep. I took over this past November of 2014, um, but I was the assistant there for two years. Um, and yeah, so it's just been, it's been a good ride. I've had some successes, That's good. so pretty excited to be doing what I'm doing. Nice. So how long has Snipes been open? They opened in 1997, so 18 okay. years. All right. Man. They were one of the post, you know, uh, bubble, right. mid-90s bubble. They, they opened um, one of the only breweries in the, in the Yakima Valley. Burt's, I don't know if Burt's was open at that time. I'm not super familiar with all of the history of sure. the Yakima uh, Brewery. Chad would be much better at it. He has lived here his entire life, but... You know, they, they opened up and started winning awards. Um, they've got they've gotten tons of World Beer Cup awards and GABF medals. Uh, we haven't done too much of that respect in the last few years, which I'd like to turn that around. But 
Well, now that you're, you haven't even been head brewer for a year, so, no. so a little over six months. Yeah, just about exactly. So, you said steep learning curve. Was that when you first started, or after you took over? Or was there after I took over? Because I, I could run the system, and you know, I was doing recipe design. Um, but what I didn't have a good grasp on was ordering, oh. scheduling, mm-hmm. uh, you know, timing. Uh, beers because we do I mean we we were pitching cone to cone and now I'm actually like brinking the yeast and checking it out before we pitch it but and then trying to like get a measured pitch um so yeah just things like that we uh were not altering our water at all Mm -hmm. Sunnyside has very very hard water Mm. I called this as soon as I took over I called the city manager um city water manager and asked you know is there an inorganic compound report that I can Mm -hmm. you know figure out you know what's going on with the water and he told me that they're working off any combination at any Mm. given time of nine wells that are all at different depths all in different areas totally inorganic totally different inorganic compound uh, makeup so we have an RO system so I just and we were not really utilizing it but so now I just only use RO water um, mm. and build everything from scratch, okay. so, which has been nice because it really gives us a lot more consistency. Mm-hmm. We were having some issues with some bitterness. I felt in some of our hoppy beers um, that was just like this really th- like thick layering bitterness that just lingered around mm-hmm. and to me wasn't super pleasant, but they were very assertive. Mm-hmm. Uh, good, I mean, they're good beers, but there's bitterness just the finish I just didn't care for and mm-hmm. for me that's all the water okay so I and, and that and changed it that changed it yeah so when you're you're drinking a bohemian pills right now which mm-hmm. was uh brewed not by me but by Chad mm-hmm. a really good beer using a um a now defunct hop mm-hmm. uh, but we have a bunch of it in our freezers uh but after that's done, I'll pour you up a Buckaroo, which is one of our session IPAs, okay. which is something I'm going for at the brewery, is just creating good, hoppy, assertive beers, but with, you know, four and a half to five, okay. five, two percent. Some beers that people can sit and drink a few of. Exactly. And not be killed by. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and this, if you keep them light, keep them crisp, mm-hmm. um, you know, you start getting too big and, and you can get into, like, a little heavy, a little too sweet. It seems like the modern palate, from what I've been able to tell, is really shifting towards a drier, you know, more hop, more aroma forward beer, less bitterness. Um, so, keeping your water, keep for me, it's water mm-hmm. and um, and keeping crystal malt as out of the malt bill as much as possible. And the lower, you know, the lower end crystals, 15 is about the highest I go anymore. Okay. For an IPA. So what size system are you brewing on? Uh, we're a 15 barrel system. Four uh, 15 barrel fermenters. It's a Newland system. It's designed to be a pub system. Mm. We have one bright tank, um, but we have eight serving tanks. Okay. So they kind of act as brights. I usually do like to do all of my conditioning and, and everything in the bright tank before I put them over there because they're in our walking which is at like 40 degrees it's mm. really hard to carbonate a beer at 40 right, degrees right. Uh, especially when they don't hold more than one atmospheric pressure so um, I do everything in that bright tank as much as possible which is a little bit of a bottleneck I'd like another bright tank but not my brewery <laughs> <laughs> is there room for one? there is yep. yeah we could yep we have we could tie in the glycol and everything it's just they haven't need. They haven't felt like they needed one previously, mm-hmm. and we're just kind of cruising at a pace that's comfortable at this point. So, so you, do you know how many barrels you're doing per year? We did. <coughs> uh, we're somewhere between. I'll probably be close to 750 this year. Okay. So not huge, um, but we really, you know, what we're not doing in volume. I feel like we're making it poor in quality. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, not every bar- not everybody has to do thirty thousand barrels, right? So I would be happy with a thousand, and that's kind of my goal. Yeah, is a thousand. I don't know that I'll hit it this year, but eventually, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd be. I'd like to get to that point. <clears throat> How many times a week are you brewing? Uh, one, about one, one average. Okay. Yeah. 
So how far is uh, the beer distributed? We are distributed, <laughs> we're distributed all over the west side of Washington. Okay. So from Vancouver up to Bellingham. Uh, with the majority of that distribution happening in the Seattle area as our distributor is in Seattle. Okay. Uh, but they do get around. Uh, and then on the east side of the mountains where we have less distribution, um, the distributor we use over here has it's a much smaller distributor. Mm. But we're you know, you'll find us in Roslyn, um, in Yakima, not a ton out some in the Tri Cities and then throughout the valley, you know, Prosser, Grandview. We're on several places there. We're on in Portland. Mm. Um, and then so that kind of extends out through the gorge a little bit. I don't know if we're as far east as the Dalles, but I know we're in the river. And um, then just kind of the Portland metropolitan area. We just were distributed up to, we just signed with a distributor this past year uh, that took us up to Vancouver, BC. Mm, okay. And so they're doing kind of a big rollout right now. Uh, actually, July 15th. Mm. If anybody wants to go to, uh, they're doing a tap takeover up there. I can't make it mm. uh, because it's a Wednesday. <laughs> and I got to work. But uh, yeah, so that's that's happening. And we're, we'd like to see uh, some more growth out in the you know, east and out in the Tri Cities in Spokane, um, but just I have one assistant, mm. and it's me, and we're pretty busy at the brewery, so it's hard to get out and go do you know a bunch of events and all the stuff that you have to do to market your beer yeah. without the help of a distributor. So. Right, right. So, what um, what styles of beer do you brew? Uh, so our main beer, so we do our our number one seller is IPA. Okay. Um, and we're, we're actually in the middle of kind of reformulating that recipe to be a little bit more uh, dry and hot forward. Uh, after that is our beer Dos Barachos, which is, uh, we call it a, a Mexican lager. It's basically Munich Hellas uh, that we add a little bit of corn and rice to. Uh, lightens up the body and kind of like accentuates the graininess a little bit, adds a little bit of sweetness from the corn. Uh, nice, good, clean, easy drinking, you know, four to five percent beer just depends on where that batch finished, mm -hmm. uh, working on the consistency with that. But that is a great beer. We do um, a, a blonde ale. Uh, we do we have a beer called Coyote Moon, which is, uh, I call it an American dark mild. It's kind of an English dark mild recipe, but I ferment it with an American ale strain, so it's a little cleaner. Mm. Um, it's a really nice beer, and that's, again, like another really sessionable beer. We have a porter. Uh, we'll do, at the end of uh, our yeast run for the lager, I'll do a Baltic porter. Mm. Um, and so that's our bandolero. And then the last time we put that out, we actually had some aged in Evan Williams barrels, so blended that with some uh, some barrel aged uh, barrel aged rye Baltic port. It's a rye Baltic port. It's like forty percent rye. Mm. Very spicy, interesting beer. Very earthy, but when you mix it with the bourbon, it just like makes it pop. It's really nice. Uh, we do, and then I do a ton of different session IPAs. I do a lot of experimental IPAs. Uh, we are just a couple blocks away from the warehouses of Yakima Chief Hop Union. And our, you know, being in the valley as a brewer, especially when you're close to Yakima Chief Hop Union, you get to know the grower owners. Mm -hmm. And so we um, have a pretty good relationship with Select Botanicals. Um, and so they will often give us, you know, experimental hops that they're looking to possibly bring to market or, you know, it's they've got enough acreage that they pelletize them and we get to use them, which is really super cool. So that's a thing that I've started is, a, I call it the Crosshair Series, and it's just single hop experimental session IPAs. Oh, nice. And uh, they're the last, so I have one in the fermenter now, which is for a hop called 430, which was an experimental hop that did not make it to market, mm. uh, but they had a lot of it in stock. It's a really great hop. But it, I think the issue was it had powdery mildew or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure uh, why it was 
not thought to be economically viable because it's a great hop. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm calling that. Uh, oh, well, that's just a crosshair 430, and then actually I'm going to do another pale ale that kind of uses that and call it uh, that and a hop. Nope, sorry, not that's not 430. That's a hop. Another discontinued hop called Sadis, which is another one that wasn't popular enough, or I'm not exactly sure what happened with it. Maybe it was too hard to harvest or something, right. but. We have a ton of that too. Um, when they discontinue hops, they still have all those pellets. And so, the previous brewer, Chad, he accessed a lot of that hops. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to do a, 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 a pale ale called Requiem. A Requiem for a hop. So, it's kind of like a swan song for that. <laughs> nice. Fruity hop. Yeah, it's just, it's cool. That's what I like about being at a place like Snipes, is I have a lot of freedom to pursue lots of different kinds of beers uh you know i have a small system i'm not no one's expecting us to like churn out you know cans of this or mm -hmm. you know one particular you know we're kind of known for lots and lots of different kinds of beers um so yeah it's cool it's cool to be able to like do something like that and people seem to dig it too uh no one else will ever be able to brew with 430. We have the world's supply. Nice. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can get to sell for $50 a bottle, right? Yeah, yeah. well, I, that's not up to me. <laughs> that's not the distributors. Or what the market will bear. Yeah. Yes. So do you guys, uh, obviously, distributing kegs, but do you bottle or can? We do. We have a forehead Mahine filler that was made in 1996. It's a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. um, it's a challenge that thing but you know we can package product with this so we we package uh ipa porter and blonde at the moment so uh, we have got to start wanting to start packaging the dos barachos um but we're as you know like if you distribute out cross state lines you have to have ttv approval on your labels and your six-pack holders and all of that so uh, i'm waiting for the online account thing okay which you have to do so, of your beers, if you um, get somebody who's from Mega Beer, and, uh, Mega Drinker, mm -hmm. and they say, you know, give me something that I might like, mm -hmm. what, what would you steer them towards? I always, always put them on Dos, dos Barachos. Oh, yeah? It's very clean, easy drinking, you know, slightly spicy from the Sterling hops. It's got that sweetness. It's got that corn. It's familiar to them, but, you know, it's a bigger-bodied, quality flavorful beer um and nine times out of ten they love it yeah and they just you know they keep drinking it so i don't know if i've necessarily converted anybody you right. know i mean macro swill drinkers are macro swill drinkers but um you know if they dig it that's what's important to me yeah yeah so before you started home brewing what kind of beer did you drink i was drinking a lot of sierra nevada okay um drinking a lot of red tail ale out of Mendocino. I was down in California for a while. Um, Eye of the Hawk. So everything from like North Coast. Uh, so you were drinking better. better yeah, I, I mean, and of course, you know, always had PBR in the fridge okay. just because it's cheap. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you could like carry cans of it while you're playing Frisbee golf, which yeah. was, I was doing a lot of that down there too. But um, yeah. And then any, you know, any time I'd go to, like, a town and there was a brewery, we'd always stop in and check it out. So, so how, was the, um, how was the jump from being a marine biologist? Uh, wildlife. Wildlife biologist. That was mostly birds. Birds. Uh, I mean, it's... I like to say that I have a science background, mm -hmm. which is, you know, lends itself to brewing. Um, but I also love beer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the jump, it was drastic there was you know lifestyle changes and all manner of things came from making that transition um but i don't regret it at all i mean i love i love being a wildlife biologist but it was a lot of travel um and a lot of hours a lot of time spent in the sun mm. so i don't know like job wise I mean, I'm, I was out in the field conducting experiments. I feel like I'm in the brewery conducting experiments. So right. it's just a different level. You know, I can see the individual 
I can't see individual yeasts like I could see individual birds and describe their behavior, but uh, I kind of it's kind of similar, I guess. You know, you're you're dealing with biochemistry and trying to get an organism to do what you want it to do. You know, giving it the right conditions to sort of go in the direction you want it to. I guess that's the whole science behind brewing. Not maybe all of it, but sure. Yeah, I mean, and like I did not, I do not have a chemistry background. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a microbiology background. So that, when I say learning curve, I mean I'm learning. To, you know, we've always been very sanitary, but like taking that to you know, you're doing any kind of yeast propagation or anything, like getting sterile. Mm -hmm. That's been fun and kind of challenging to learn that. Um, the chemistry, I really rely on guys like Colin Kaminsky uh, and, and John Palmer. Their water book is key. Anyone who wants to know anything, or is, you know, like me, is starting out basically knowing nothing, and you know it's important, I highly recommend getting that book. Um, and then another good tool that I've used for water is Bruin. It's called Bruin Water, B R U N water it's just a calculator you can download it online uh, give the guys a donation it is a powerful tool for altering water mm, nice. it's awesome so that's been good yeah and obviously like you said water is important to you it's I, I feel like if you're not if you don't have a handle on your water then you don't have a handle on your beer you know I mean yeah yeast you know yeast cleanliness and, and management and water to me when I think about beer, that's what you're drinking. I mean, water's defined every mm -hmm. style around the world of mm -hmm. beer that exists. Um, and now we have the ability to manipulate water to do what we want it to. So right. it's pretty cool. And, you know, if you're <coughs> water, if you want to make hobby beers and your water's full of bicarbonate, it's not going to be good. <laughs> so. so are there any styles that you would like to pursue? I am a sour beer nerd, okay. sour beer guy, uh, especially fruit sours, fruited sours, and we, Snipes is owned by a fruit processing company, oh, Okay. so we have great access to fruit, mm -hmm. um, not all kinds of fruit, but, mm -hmm. um, so I'm really interested in pursuing that, um, running a few experiments right now, um, on the wild, you know, wild American wild side, so like more bread focused than bacteria focused, but okay. uh, because I feel like I can control that a little better than I can the bugs at this point, given my situation. But yeah, eventually I'd like to be doing you know wood fermentation and uh, and stuff like that, and doing mm -hmm. some some pretty crazy fruited weirdness. We've done a lot of sour stuff in the past. Uh, Chad, the previous brewer, me, he just put everything in barrels and mm -hmm. let it go. We do. When I was working with him, we did a lot of blending, so that was really fun to be able to like pull things out and take ratios and like figure out your blend and then you know blend it and and. But we never bottle that much of that stuff, right? So I'd really like to get into that. We do have a bottler now that we can use for sour that will be separate from our clean, oh, okay. clean bottling, which is you know, huge. You have to right. that, so. Yeah, yeah. I talked to one brewer that doesn't want to do sour. So he doesn't want bacteria in his clean brewery at all. Right. <laughs> I mean, to some degree, I, I feel the same. Um, I'm, I'm mostly worried about acetic. I mean, we're we're very very clean. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm doing caustic washes and acid washes and you know everything on my fermenters. And you know, if something were to get sour, you know, I would replace all those soft parts and. I've done a lot of going through the brewery and replacing a lot of old soft parts that should have probably been replaced previously. So, I I mean, it's in there, though. You mm -hmm. know, an 18-year-old brewery, oh, yeah. there's been eight or nine brewers through there. Oh, wow. You don't okay. you just don't know, you know, <coughs> what what's what. Right? right. So, as long as I can keep the interiors clean mm -hmm. I feel like I'm good <laughs> I do I mean we have we had barrels of sour beer sitting in the brewery and I we haven't we have, once in a while a keg will come back that's you know gone sour but I mean 
I think everybody gets that. So you don't just tell them that it was a sour beer and they just got no. it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but and, you know, if every keg was coming back sour, that'd yeah. be one thing. But it's just like a random keg, so I mark those kegs. You know, make sure that we like tear them down, acid wash them, replace what parts we can on them, and before we put them out in service. Sometimes I'll just use them as a sour keg. Yeah. You know, like the keg is now just a sour keg. So. Right. So, uh, what, um, if, what do you think right now your biggest obstacle has been? Has it been the learning curve? Has it been trying to, uh, you know, the water or something else? Uh, obstacle to... You know, obstacle challenge. Oh, man. Uh... We operate on a, in a on a very tight budget. Okay. So that's challenging. Um, the brewery needed a lot of work, so that was a challenge uh, coming in. Uh, our just for example, our hot liquor tank. When I came, if you would have looked inside it, there would have been a quarter inch of a scale, mineral scale, on the inside mm. of it. So my assistant and I got in there with a chisel mm. and high pressure water and blasted as much of that as we could and then just ran cycles and cycles of acid through it to bring it back to stainless. Mm. It's now essentially brand new. Um, so, you know, it's just things like that. It's just, it's an, it's an older brewery um, that hasn't had a lot of consistent care there, you know. So that's, that's been, that's been challenging. It's an older system too, so there's not a lot of control. Um, and it's you know sometimes like a thermometer, you know, just will like all randomly just like become uncalibrated, mm -hmm. and uh, so you know your your temp is like way off. Uh, stuff like that, I mean, right? Just and being you know working in an older older brewery is it's been a challenge. So like all the awards that have been won over the years. Mm -hmm. um, all different brewers? Yes. Um, yep. There's a guy, Chris Miller, who's now down at Berryessa Brewing in uh, Woodland, or Winters. I think it's Winters, California. Uh, he was a previous brewer, Chad. He won... Uh, I know he won a silver for the Coyote Moon. Um, and I, I don't even remember. I don't even know who brewed what. Right. Um, back before internet there's just there's paper records <laughs> yeah. in there you know like they weren't even on the computer um but the same recipes going throughout time for the most get, part they get altered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean as tastes change new brewers come in you know as ingredients change mm -hmm. some of the hops that they were using you know i either don't have can't get or don't exist anymore. Like, right. You know, stuff just drops out. They just drop it out of production because it doesn't sell. Right. Or, you know, people stop wanting it. Mm -hmm. You know, wanting that hop for whatever reason. So. so, how many beers do you normally keep in production? Is it a certain one? Uh, IPA is always, there's always IPA, there's always Dos Barachos, there's always Coyote Moon. There's always extra blonde. There's always our Sunnyside Pale. There's always Tennessee Porter. Um, and then I like to, you know, have a session IPA go through. Uh, come a triple IPA season, I guess you call it, beginning of February, there'll be a triple IPA, uh, which we we got first place for at the Hot Mob okay. Triple IPA Fest this past February, so that nice. was pretty cool. Um, was that yours or was that? Yeah, that was mine. Nice. That was like one of my first beers awesome. uh, out of uh, that I did mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. Pretty excited about that. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if you came to the brewery, there's there's a lot. There's a lot of we have like I can't remember like twelve taps or something. Okay. Um, eight of which come off. Serving tanks, and then the other four are off kegs, and uh, all different stuff. We have a Vienna lager. Um, I don't. 
pre Chad, he was brewing a lot of different lagers. He did the Bohemian Pills, he did a Vienna Lager, he did a Maybach, and then Dos Barachos. He might be, oh, and then the Bandoleros. That's five lagers, which mm -hmm. on a brewery our size, like, that's a lot of real estate to take mm -hmm. up for yeah. a beer. I mean, just those five beers right there. And then Dos is constant in production, mm -hmm. so you're talking <coughs> two fermenters out of four gone right there. Right. Um, so, mm -hmm. I would like to brew more lagers. It's just, I, I know why guys don't. It's, yeah. It just takes so much time. Mm -hmm. But they are very popular. They're increasingly popular, especially, you know, for a long time, people were like, ah, Pilsner, lager, not into it. But all of a sudden, everybody, you know, it's just the, the way the market goes. Last year at this time, Saison's were like blowing up. Everybody's making Saison's like crazy. You can't sell a Saison right now to save your life. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah. it's my favorite style. I yeah. brew Saison's like, all day long, if mm -hmm. good, you know, but yeah. you got to sell the beer. So. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, anything that, uh, any other things that uh, that you would like to like to do as a brewer on, in your growth or anything like that? Uh, sours. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what I think about pretty much yeah. all day. Uh, <laughs> it's like pursuing that um, mostly just so I can drink them we don't get a lot of sours over here on the east side of the oh, really? so I just want to be able to drink good sour beer I'm very excited for Holy Mountain uh, if you've been over there yet or talked to those guys but oh, yeah. they are I was just there not too long ago and they gave me a little tour around and uh, poured me some beers and they have some very solid uh, they know what they're doing mm -hmm. so I'm excited to see what comes out of that and I'm hoping that Washington can step up I mean we've, there's been a few guys Silver City always does a good job um, you know there's Black Raven does a good job with their you know funky stuff but it's all it all seems to be kind of like one off like mm -hmm. you know specialty stuff but we need like someone like the Commons up here just like making good solid sour farmhouse beers uh, for cheap yeah so yeah awesome yeah all right, Chris, thanks for visiting us, no with us today. Thanks for coming out. Awesome. All right, thanks to Chris for joining us today. Since it's the beginning of the month, let's try another beer. This time we have Twilight Ale from Deschutes Brewing. Can't find my opener. There it is. Deschutes Twilight Ale by Deschutes Brewery. Deschutes Brewery opened in 1988 as a small public house in downtown Bend, Oregon. They now have two locations, and they are family-owned. All right, uh, this is a lighter one compared to the last one. Oh, definitely. Um, about half the color. <laughs> but the flavor is uh, pretty good there. Um, the Shoots Twilight Ale is a lighter. There you go. Yet full-flavored aromatic oh, wow. ale for the lawn days of summer, which are almost over. Twilight's uh, solid malt foundation pairs with distinctive Amarillo hops for flavors every bit as intriguing as bigger, heavier ales. A back porch, lingering sunset wonder. 35 IBUs and 5% ABV. Right. Very good. I wasn't expecting that much flavor in such a light beer, I guess. Yeah, that's good. I like that one. Okay, we'll be right back after a local music break from Beatrix Sky. Just in her. 
was Daydreamer by Beatrix Sky. You can check her out at BeatrixSky.bandcamp.com. If you want to have your music played on Northwest Brew Talk, you need to contact us today. And now let's try another beer. That was quick. Time to another beer. All right. This time we have Fishtail Organic Amber Ale from Fish Brewing Company. A fish Brewing Company, Leavenworth Beers, opened in 1993 in Olympia. They have a tap room in Winville as well as an, uh, uh, the Olympia Brew Pub. Fishtail Organic Amber Ale is a medium bodied with an appealing amber hue. This is the first ale of the Republic. Its organic pale Munich and crystal malts create a gentle sweet character that's difficult to resist. From organic Howler Tower Tops. Come a zesty flavor and aroma that's beautifully balanced organic amber's malt profile. The result, truly delicious ale that salutes organic farmers and all the goodness they bring to our tables. IBU on the spear are tw- is 22 and ABV 5%. Okay. This one is a darker amber, uh, kind of like the first one. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Nice head on it. and uh, We've been favoring our ambers, huh? <laughs> mm-hmm. Last two weeks. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I need to get some uh, some uh, IPAs. It's been, a f- <laughs> been a few weeks, but yeah, this is good for a, an organic beer, which is very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, got a nice flavor to it. Nice it, head uh, to it. Yeah, it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be anything that you would expect. It's got a nice flavor. I want you to give me fresh beer. <laughs> you serious? <laughs> now. Welcome to Fresh Beer. This week's Fresh Beer is from Hales Ales. 2015 Autumn Beer from Hales Ales, O'Brien's Harvest Ale. First introduced in 1986, this is the Northwest Original Harvest Ale. Hardy, complex, aromatic, and delicious. O'Brien's Harvest Ale is much-anticipated Northwest Classic and a silver medal winner at the 2008 GABF Great American Beer Festival. This year, we've added German Munich malt to the recipe and the hops and include El Dorado, Chinook, Mosaic, Lemon Drop, and Centennials. ABV 7.2%, IBUs 45. It's available in kegs and six-pack bottles August through October. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Northwest Brew Talk. Make sure you tune in next week when we chat with North Jetty Brewing. This show is produced and edited by me with engineering help from Michelle Rizzo. If you want to contact us, you can email us at nwbrewtalk at gmail.com or give us a call at 541-595-TALK. Until next time, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. Stay hopping off